All right. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to bring up a PowerPoint slide here. Hold on just a second. This will be lesson two in a series of eyewitnesses of Jesus. All told, there will probably be seven or eight lessons. That may be a, a long series, maybe longer than I intended, but uh, I've got so much information to present. I don't see how in the world that I could possibly present uh, that in any uh, less than, than uh, seven or eight lessons. But here's the thing. If you haven't seen or heard the lesson number one from a week ago Sunday, I urge you to go to the, the website, trueseekers.org, and listen to number one because it kind of sets the stage for everything that, that follows. And one of the things I dealt with last week, it was last Sunday morning, is that you have on page after page after page in the New Testament, this idea that consistently comes up that the apostles and others who were writers of the New Testament were eyewitnesses of Jesus and are recording that, particularly in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but it, you have references to Jesus' earthly life his death, burial, and resurrection, even in the epistles and the book of Revelation, for that matter. And so you've got all of these references that say, in essence, that, that we are eyewitnesses, direct eyewitnesses, and we are testifying of what we have seen and heard. However, there is a competing alternative worldview with a competing narrative that totally dismisses that eyewitness testimony. And so what we're dealing with in these lessons is the framework from which we can be amazed by Jesus. I think Derek is doing a great job on Sunday mornings, but I hope to enhance the good job that he's doing even more so with background information for why we should trust Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the other writers in the New Testament, when we pick up these accounts and we read about Jesus, we're living in a time, and this is another idea I dealt with last Sunday, we're living in a time in which Christianity is increasingly attacked and dismissed as irrelevant, and we are attacked uh, as holding a, a viewpoint that is on par with Jack and the Beanstalk rather than something that is grounded and rooted in history and in eyewitness testimony. And so with that in mind, I think it's it's really important to be able to defend the faith. It's really important to, to be able to know that what we're reading gives us certainty about what really happened, that Jesus, uh, our faith is a Jesus that entered the world of space and time, human history, and that we have every reason for confidence in the gospel accounts as given to us in the pages of the New Testament. Very important also because as your children grow up, they're going to, to go to, to school and this idea is going to be attacked, especially when they go to university, but I believe even before they go off to university, if they're in the public school system, they may have uh, be subject to many attacks even even there and you need to be aware of that and uh, we need to talk about that and so hence a series like this but i'm going into more detail than i ever have before on this subject because i believe that the timing is is critical uh and these ideas are uh becoming more and more uh, prevalent in the alternative narratives to how the gospels got here so Lesson number two in the series, apostolic design or random myth. Are we dealing with one or the other two broad categories of possibility in terms of the Gospels? And the way we're going to, to look at this in the weeks to come, and I've got some um, wildly interesting data and uh, facts that I'll be presenting in, in the weeks to come about examining the Gospels in terms of uh, of looking at external uh, facts that correlate or corroborate what we can read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
We'll also be looking at them internally, the internal cohesion and consistency of, of the accounts and try to, to peg holes in, in what they have to say or, or see how successful uh, one could be in, in consistently doing that. But when we talk about external proof, we're talking about contemporary testimony from non-Christians, what did Josephus, Tacitus, or Pliny say about um, Jesus, about early Christianity, about uh, how all this movement got off the ground to begin with? When we talk about contemporary testimony from believers out, outside the New Testament, um, what did Christians such as Papias and Polycarp, who knew the Apostle John, what did they say about this? What did Irenaeus, who was uh, a, a disciple, if you will, or a learner of from Polycarp in his younger years, who claims that Polycarp was um, in in uh, a friend of John the uh, uh, the Apostle John. Uh, so he's one link removed from from John. And uh, how do we analyze uh, those things? And so examining local details, geographical details, social details, proper names, governmental officials, the historical context, and are there are there pegs, are there reference points that where comparisons can can be made? Compare historical, literary, archaeological details. Is there any evidence for reliability or corruption in the transmission of, of the records? We'll be looking at, at some of those things. Uh, internally, we'll be looking at things such as undesigned coincidences in the different accounts. I have a few things I'm going to show you that are absolutely wild and can't wait to share them, but uh, not tonight. Uh, you'll have to wait for some of these. Apply the rules of evidence for eyewitness testimony. There's a, a, a definite distinction between someone who takes the witness stand who is absolutely telling the truth versus someone who takes the witness stand and is telling a tall story. And so what are the, the basic rules of testimony that have a bearing on that to, to help differentiate the two? And we'll apply those rules to, to the um, uh, accounts. Are there fingerprints indicating fiction or authenticity in what is relayed? Now, one thing that, that is really important, and, I, and what I'm going to present tonight is every bit as important if not more so than what I present in the next few weeks about internal and external testimony. It may not seem so at, at first glance because I'm repackaging some things you already know, but I'm going to, to present some things that are, are really, really important to stand back and look at with fresh eyes, particularly in this society. And one thing that, that we have to admit right off the bat, is that there is a time lag between the events, the historical events of Jesus of Nazareth and the time that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are eventually published in their present form. No question that there's a time lag involved. Skeptics will put a huge time lag there and push Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to the late first century. It used to be that skeptics would put even in history late second century. So for believers, there is a time lag of some at least 25 years before the first gospel is published. And by the time you get the, to the Gospel of John, you're talking about the end of the first century in all likelihood. So I believe Matthew, Mark, and Luke were probably written it's possible Matthew is written in the late 50s, but into the early 60s for Matthew, Mark, and probably Luke, and then John in the 90s AD. And yet Jesus dies on a cross and is raised AD 30 or 33, I think probably AD 33 for reasons I won't get into right now. So why 25 or 30 years later? Is that a problem? Is that a deficiency or is it an asset? Is it a weakness or is it a strength? And I would say right off the bat that I hadn't thought a whole lot about that for many, many years. But uh, 
I'll give you a, a, a few reasons why that is actually a strength or an asset versus a liability. I have a, a World War I memoir that was written by an actual soldier. He wrote a diary in the trenches of World War I, but he didn't publish it. In fact, he worked on it, on the wording of it, and, and fleshing it out so that it would be just right the rest of his life. And he died in, I think, 1973 or four. So he died, you know, uh, like 55 years after the, the war ended. And it still wasn't published. In fact, his, his children uh, published it like 20 years later after that, and they got some help with some other people writing introduction, preface, and so on. And uh, comparing some of the events that he wrote about uh, with um, uh, what was known in, by external sources, and they added some details and so on. But it's an absolutely brilliantly uh, written uh, memoir but he worked on it his whole life to try to perfect the way that certain things were packaged. And, uh, and then at the, uh, after he was dead and gone, then it was, then it was actually published to the world. It was called suddenly we didn't want to die. It's actually a great book, by the way. And I thought about this, you know, when I write a book, I, I almost always, after it's published, the day after it's published, I, I, I see something. Why didn't I change that? Why didn't I add that? And then after I think about a few things uh, later on, I there, there's a whole there are whole chapters I could could have added that. Uh, so the longer I chew on something, the better uh, it becomes in, in the long run. And I'd like to, to 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 put before you the idea that even though I believe that Matthew, Mark, Luke and John were all guided by the Holy Spirit in this process, that the individual units of what really happened in the life of Jesus were preached over a long period of time, tested on the field of battle, through fiery trial, through preaching both to friend and to foe, through public debate. And these gospels were published in their most polished form only at the end of that process and toward the end of their lives, if you will. So gist of the individual episodes never changed, never, ever changed. But the presentation of them in the final version of the form or packaging of it is such that the best was saved for last. They were on hand, in person, with eyewitnesses galore for three decades, and then these Gospels begin to be published at the very end of, of certain apostles' lives. And uh, if you think about it from that point of view, it's actually an asset or a strength rather than something that uh, is published right there then, uh, uh, right the, the day after Jesus uh, uh, is raised from the dead, for example. There are two models, two, two broad ways of looking at the Gospel. One is apostle supervised. The other is as evolutionary legends that occur over a great deal of time. From the apostle supervised point of view, which I take, which most of us would take, the apostles formally organized and transmitted the message. In the evolutionary view, then you've got no one presiding and the process is unpredictable, totally random over a great deal of time. You got time plus impersonal chance just as in the theory of, of the general theory of evolution, for example, and this would be the literary counterpart, I suppose, to that. With apostle supervision, you have direct eyewitnesses and a rapid formation into a fixed form of individual episodes. In the evolutionary view, you've got time, chance, embellishment, with no documentation over a long period of time. In the apostle supervised view, the accounts are standardized, fixed early on, preached widely, essentially memorized by many Christians. And uh, in the evolutionary view, you've got a late publication of the Gospels preceded by a long period of fluid, fluid oral traditions, no fixed parameters. Um, in the apostle supervised view, the, the Gospels preserved what was commonly known by oral proclamation for many, many years. In the evolutionary legend view, the Gospels formally present at the end of the first century a Jesus of myth that is totally distinct from the Jesus of history, 
with very little correspondence between the two. But here's something I, I, I'm going to throw out. I want you to think about if you've never thought about it before. And it's this. That if you open up the Gospels, you've got these individual paragraphs that deal with different episodes. And the English Standard Version puts a, a paragraph heading on every one of those. And you can compare the paragraph heading for feeding of 5,000 in Matthew with the feeding of 5,000 in Mark, with the feeding of 5,000 in Luke, and they read almost the same. There are going to be slight variations that reflect editorial perspective or eyewitness memory, differences in perspective, slight differences in, 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 in a word here or there, or a few words of, of presentation. There are slight detail differences. One gospel will bring out this detail, another one will bring out that deal detail but by and large you have you can put them in parallel columns and they read almost the same but not quite not quite but almost the same and here's what i want you to think about you may have never thought about it before and that is the the gospels as at least the synoptic gospels especially matthew mark and luke contain all these individual units of episodes and the compilation of those narrative units these preaching units if you will I believe occurred very fast, very early, while the apostles were still in Jerusalem. And they preach these things over and over and over and over and over and over. And I believe that they were essentially memorized not only by preachers, but by virtually every Christian that even before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were in their present published form, that the typical Christian in the first century would have known these episodes as well or better than the typical Christian today knows them. You may have never thought about that, but I want you to think about it because I believe that is absolutely the truth. It's, it's amazing to me how, how two people looking at the exact same thing can come to such radically different conclusions. And that's the, that's the case here when you have a skeptic looking at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you have a believer looking at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they're coming to such radically different conclusions about their historical reliability. Reminds me of Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. You know, if people do not see what is there, even when it is staring them in the face, we, we scratch our heads in, in disbelief. But it, it, it's kind of like the old adage, we, we see what we want to see. Or as Dale Carnegie, I believe, it once said, it is difficult to get a man to see something if he has a vested interest in not seeing it. That's true of a lot of things in life, but it's certainly true of, of, of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you've got these four accounts, one gospel, four accounts. And, and even in the earliest manuscripts that are complete for, for each of these books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the introductory page has, according to, to Matthew, or gospel according to Matthew. And you get to the very end, the last page, and it would say again, according to Matthew. Same for Mark, same for Luke, same for John. I've heard a lot of skeptics and, and those who take a, a radically different view will, will argue that, that these titles were not there in the beginning and they were only added in the uh, second century. And, um, uh, that that uh, the, the four Gospels are anonymous. And uh, I'm going to argue that, that, number one, there are internal clues about who wrote each of these. Number two, there are statements of early Christians galore who were still in connection of those links of the chain to eyewitnesses or one link removed. Galore statements about who, who wrote these four Gospels. And the oldest manuscripts that we have already have these titles in them. And, and no one can say they were added later in, on the basis of hard evidence. 
because the oldest manuscripts we have already have the titles there. And so you're pulling an assumption out of thin air with zero evidence to argue that uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were not uh, associated with the documents themselves from the very beginning. You're arguing on the basis of, of uh, the absence of evidence, which is, which is not uh, any rock solid evidence at all. Notice that two of these are apostles and two of them work very closely with apostles. We'll come back to that idea a, a little bit later. But from the very beginning, based on the evidence that we do have, even outside the gospels, you have apostles driving the whole foundation of everything the church rested on. That much is very clear from the epistles of Paul, even that are, are not even questioned in terms of being from Paul and being from a, a relatively early date from, uh, uh, you know, Paul wrote his epistles roughly from AD 50 to AD 65. And so AD 50, which is about the date of Galatians, give or take, maybe a year either either way. If Jesus died in AD 33 and Paul writes Galatians in AD 50, that's 17 years later. And he writes some things about Jesus. He writes some things about collaboration with Peter, James, and John. And uh, 17 years is less time, less of a time lag, than uh, 911 to today, which is 19 years. You think about that, chew on that for, for a little while. And that's not up to a whole lot of dispute. Most scholars of, of all backgrounds will accept uh, that, general, that general date. So apostolic, Ephesians 2, 20 and 21, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. Hebrews 2, 3, and 4, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us. So the Hebrew writer writing to recipients, I believe in first century Palestine, uh, who were one link of the chain removed from Jesus, in some cases at least, it was attested to us by those who heard, those who heard Jesus, the Lord, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. First John 4, verse 2, we're going to get into this a little bit later when we open up the Gospel of John in a future lesson. But I, first, second, third John are very close to, to the Gospel of John in various ways. And uh, you have uh, a kind of an editorial we, we'll talk about that. But uh, uh, he's, he's talking about himself and some other apostles, I believe. But uh, by this, you know, the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. We, we apostles are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not God, from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So you have apostles who are, who are uh, telling others about Jesus Christ as well as his will in the New Testament. And um, Acts 10, we have a, a case in point, uh, Peter going to the household of Cornelius, preaching about Jesus. This is not in the Gospels, but it is in Acts, the sequel to, the, to Luke. But God raised him up on the third day, made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as, as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. So you have this idea early on in the earliest evidence that we have that the apostles were there testifying, claiming to be eyewitnesses, and uh, in their earliest preaching, from Acts 2 on, in fact, you have eyewitness testimony claims all over the place, and uh, that passage was in our uh, lesson last week. Acts 2.42, the very earliest disciples in Jerusalem, the first local church, the Jerusalem church, days after Jesus had risen from the dead and had ascended back into heaven, the earliest disciples devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And so based on the evidence that we had, I'm, I'm not about to excise the apostles out of the process. I believe they were heavily involved from day one and they continued to be involved hands-on 
to render eyewitness testimony for the rest of their lives until the day that they died and became martyrs for Christ in most cases. So Richard Bauckham, in a more recent book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, says the apostles remain throughout their lifetime as the sources and the authoritative guarantors of the records of what Jesus said and did. I, I believe that. I believe that's exactly accurate and uh, a, an accurate statement of, of the evidence that I look at. So you've got one gospel, four accounts. It wasn't Matthew's gospel, Mark's gospel, Luke's gospel. It was the gospel, according to, to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, according to John. And one gospel, four accounts. And Matthew and John were apostles. Mark was associated with Peter. We'll get into that a little bit next week. Luke was associated with uh, Paul. And uh, so uh, you have apostolic footprints on all four of these gospels that we'll get into a little bit more later on. But another idea closely associated with this is the, is the whole idea, and you see this in both Testaments, but uh, um, the idea of, of the original recipients of the message, first generation of Christians in, in this case, that received the, the, the documents we call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as well as the other documents that, that comprise the New Testament. You have technical language of, of delivering and receiving. There's a, a much more formal process involved in that. I deal with some of that when I, I teach lessons on how we got the Bible, but uh, there, there's, there's just a whole uh, uh, series of passages in the New Testament that use this, this uh, language of delivering and, and receiving. The faith which was once for all delivered to the saints, uh, Jude verse three. I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. And he talks about the death, burial, resurrection, and post-resurrection appearances of Jesus there. You who received the law as delivered by angels did not keep it. That's Old Testament. Stephen preaching to the Sanhedrin council and those who were about to kill him. First Thessalonians 2 verse 13, Paul telling the church in Thessalonica, we also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive from the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. You have... Uh, Galatians 1 verse 9, as we have said before, so say I now again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one that you received, let him be accursed. Or 1 Corinthians 11 to maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And so, again, look, putting all this together, you, you, and what Paul is, is about to say in verses 24 and 25 are almost word for word identical to what Luke writes about the Lord's Supper in Luke chapter 22. Even though when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, Luke as we have it was not yet published, probably. And so, um, in fact, it, I'm, I'm pretty confident that it wasn't uh, published in his present form. And yet you have individual units that were already being preached and taught, including the institution of the Lord's Supper, case in point, that uh, reads almost identically to the institution of the Lord's Supper in, uh, in Luke 22. We live in a, a print digital media culture, internet culture, um, the first Christians um, lived in a, in a culture of oral reading. It was a communal reading culture, if you will. Uh, they had communal reading events as entertainment. People would come together and someone would read Homer, uh, Iliad or Odyssey. Um, in the synagogue, they would read the Old Testament. In the church, they would read the Old Testament and the New Testament. And um, there were there were lit literacy rates that were probably considerably lower than than what uh, is typical for today, but even people who could not read would listen to those who could, and this was so widespread in the in the first uh, century that context clues were intended for the ears instead of the eyes, because even something that was publicly read. Uh, you didn't have PowerPoint, you didn't have chalkboards, you didn't have uh, 
typical visuals. So when John would write an epistle toward uh, the end of his life, Second John 12, he says, though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. Uh, both carried equal authority, obviously. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, so then brothers stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. It didn't matter whether it was uh, the Apostle Paul in person or the Apostle Paul via letter. Both carried the same weight of, of uh, apostolic authority. And Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse uh, 12 through 15, that the putting off of his tabernacle is imminent, and therefore he would make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able to recall these things. And uh, what things? Well, the things that he could tell them by way of oral rehearsal of his own personal memories, as well as what he knew to be true of the gospel of Christ. He goes on to say in verses 16 and following, that uh, we were eyewitnesses of these things, and he, and he mentions the transfiguration. But if he didn't write that down, uh, and uh, if it were not recorded in the Gospel of Mark, we'll talk about that next week as well, because Peter's fingerprints are all over the Gospel of Mark, then, uh, then we might be lacking in something very important about Peter personally testifying about that, because he was one of three disciples who actually uh, was on that mountain. Another another case in point that uh, comes up here. Well, let me let me let me say one more thing about this, um, and, and it will re-impress you know what I'm trying to to communicate here. How how widespread communal reading was, and how seriously the ancients took it. They would they would hear things uh, read or recited over and over again, and um, um, when Jerome at the end of the fourth century, translated the Greek New Testament into a new version of Latin. And there, there was an old version of Latin so that in the Western churches that where the Latin was widely spoken, the new Latin Vulgate replaced the old Latin version. And in the book of Jonah, in, in Jerome's new version of the Latin, there was a one word difference in the Latin word that he used in Jonah versus the old Latin version. And Augustine, very famous theologian, scholar, wrote a letter to Jerome and said that when Jonah was read in his church, the one word difference caused an uproar. That's how well the congregation knew the book of Jonah as it was being read week after week after week. One word difference caused an uproar in the congregation. Question, do you not believe for a moment that these earliest Christians had that kind of hunger to memorize the individual episodes that are later packaged in the more complete Gospels we know as Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You think for a moment they would not have known that. Uh, I, I don't. Uh, I, I believe full, fully that uh, they, were, they were conversant with those details. One of the reasons is you have this oral teaching that was so widespread, it's, it's conveyed through a Greek word, uh, katakeo, uh, the Catholics hijacked that word and used it for catechism later on. That's where the catechism comes from. But it means to, to orally teach. And oral teaching was prevalent, and it went on over and over again. Uh, it's not always translated orally taught or orally, orally teach in the New Testament, but that's the, that's the connotation. So in, in Luke chapter 1, for example, Luke... Um, and this is interesting. I, let's let's look at, at Luke 1 for just a moment. Uh, Luke chapter 1, he says, Any, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. I believe the, you have early compilations in crude notebooks of all these episodes or many of the episodes that we later read in, uh, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that were crude collections of different episodes of the life of Jesus. 
He says, in, in as much as, as many have undertaken to compile these things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. Again, this corresponds to, to, to the way I think this, this plays out. He says, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. And again, the idea is from Katakeo is taught orally. Now he's going to get a written, polished version of the full thing in writing from start to finish um, in, a, in a much more polished, orderly presentation of all of these episodes strung together, I believe in chronological order. And so um, again, in Acts 18.25, you have Apollos coming into contact with Aquila and Priscilla, and he had been instructed, and the, again, the idea from Katakeo, orally instructed in the way of the Lord. So he knew about Jesus. Being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. You think they weren't interested in accuracy prior to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John being recorded in their present form? Absolutely, they were interested in accuracy about what happened with Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John, so that's what they corrected. He spoke accurately things concerning Jesus, even prior to the publication of the Gospels as we now have them. And then finally, uh, Galatians 6 and verse 6, you have uh, let him uh, who is taught the word or orally taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. We often interpret that in terms of uh, financial support, but another view of that passage is that instead of interpreting it as a sharing of material things, uh, a sharing of the spiritual things, the oral teaching was memorized, and it was packaged in a way to be easily memorized, and there was recitation and there was repetition, and I would suggest to you that, uh, you know, we sing the song, um, I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. The early Christians loved to tell that story too. And the idea here, I believe, is that the teacher would teach these episodes. Christians would not only learn them, they would memorize them. And then they would go tell somebody else. And they would share in that. So you unleash an army of Christians who had taken these individual paragraphs of our Gospels before the Gospels were written, and they'd have them memorized. And they would go tell that, th that story to, to people everywhere. Think about that. Uh, published orally by word of mouth with notebooks with the help of the Holy Spirit intended for the ears and not the eyes, later put to writing. Think of the process as releasing a, a subsequent edition in a new format. Or think of an audible book versus an electronic format versus a, a physical traditional book. Um, you got the same book, whether you got a book on the Kindle or a book in uh, Audible or a, a physical book. And, and I've actually got a book where I've got it in all, all, th all three of those versions. It's kind of redundant, but, uh, um, but it's the same book. And that's the point, the same, the same book. Early corroboration, you have Paul uh, or Peter vouching for Paul's epistles, calling them scripture in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, even though he says some of his writings are hard to understand, some of his letters. But Paul, in turn, citing a scripture in Luke 10, 7, side by side with Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. Deuteronomy 25, verse 4, he says, the, the scripture, even as the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox as it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages, which is an exact quote of Luke 10, verse 7, which I believe was already in existence by the time Paul writes 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18. And Paul cites both of those passages and calls them scripture. 
Uh, Paul mentions collaboration with James and Cephas and John in Galatians 2, verse 9. Again, in, a, in, a, in a, an epistle written no more than maybe 17, 18 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. James, Cephas, and John were all there. Paul may not have been, even though he was around in Jerusalem. But, but James, Cephas, and John were eyewitnesses. And, and yet they gave each other the right hand of fellowship. Interestingly enough, and I'll just throw this in for free, the order in which Paul cites those names, James would be the brother of the Lord, Cephas would be Peter, John would be the apostle, John, the son of Zebedee. Um, the order of our general epistles in the, in the uh, end of the, the New Testament, after Hebrews, what, what's the next book? James, and what comes after James? First and second Peter, and what comes after Peter, first, second, and third John, they're in the same order that, that Paul gives them, interestingly enough here. There's also a chronological connection, I believe. I think James was first, then Peter's epistles, then John's. And at least three of Paul's travel companions that play a prominent role in his, his ministry were members of the earliest Jerusalem church. Barnabas, John, Mark, Silas were all, all there at the very beginning of, of the church, or the early days of the church, at least. Uh, if Paul were preaching all kinds of things about what Jesus said and did that departed from the material facts of the case, and he says all kinds of things about Jesus in his epistles, don't you believe that for, for a moment he would have been corrected right on the spot by those who knew better there? But these skeptics build a house of cards. They classify the four Gospels as legends, fiction, and folklore. They argue that, that the early Christians made things up about Jesus. They argue that, that visionary reports of, of a Jesus of faith were garbled as part of the official record in place of the historical Jesus that subsequent uh, people who heard a story repeated over and over again got it mixed up, and, and all of a sudden someone's vision about Jesus got inserted into the actual telling of, of what Jesus did in space and time so uh they call it a sort of plastic surgery at least e.p sanders does calls it a plastic surgery to glorify the image of jesus in the collective memory so you have rejection of the evidence that we have which leads them to come up with an alternative theory that consists of several layers of false assumptions and wishful thinking pulled out of thin air with zero hard evidence and you must understand that there is zero hard evidence for, for this. In truth, the core message did not change. Peter received from the Lord the same Lord's Supper message found in Luke. He makes a distinction between what the Lord had taught him divorce and remarriage, what he adds as an apostle in 1 Corinthians 7. So much for the visionary Jesus getting garbled with the historical Jesus. The death, burial, and resurrection and appearances of Jesus Christ were received and, and delivered, as he talks about in 1 Corinthians 15. And all this from the very beginning, from the very beginning. Jesus promised the apostles, you will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. And from the beginning, they taught things like we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. I want to give a, a plausible procedure. I'm about done. You've been a, a kind to, to listen to me this long. I've had a, a lot. I'm cramming a lot in here. I understand that. But I've got some exciting things in the next few weeks. Plausible operating procedure with the help of the Holy Spirit, the apostles compiled their collective and individual memories. Only three were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration or with him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And they would have had to testify those three but uh, all of the apostles put their collective memories together. And uh, first, or, or the Gospel of John, chapter 14 and verse tw uh, 26, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all the truth, and he will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And so they had these infallible powers of remembrance according to the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus had promised. They then put these individual episodes into easily remembered easily digestible, compact narrative units, a reader's digest form, if you will. And they were standalone 
but also fixed. Handy for preaching, easy to memorize. Those episodes were translated from the Jewish Aramaic into the Greek. Occasionally, you'll read in the gospel some of the uh, Jewish Aramaic that was in some of the episodes like Talitha Kumi or Ephratha or Maranatha or uh, you know other, other uh, names, for instance. And then finally, these units, uh, after being translated into in the Greek, uh, as well as floating around in Greek and Jewish Aramaic, depending on the audience, were the foundation of early preaching about Jesus. They were preached over and over and over and over again, and eventually combined in the synoptic accounts with slightly different perspectives from the point of view of memory, eyewitness testimony, or editorial arrangement, so that when you put some of these events side by side, Matthew's account, Mark's account, Luke's account, they read in very similar language. But I believe that's a reflection of the earlier eyewitness testimony that uh, is put into these reader di Reader's Digest units that would be easy for preaching and for memorizing. And, uh, but a cap on unrestrained speculation as far as the skeptics are concerned, they try to push these gospels as far back into the future as they possibly can, into the first century, into the second century. But there's a problem with that. Early manuscripts shorten the time lag between the actual events and the publication of the gospels. And they even date those as late as they possibly can, but it's hard to date some of them late. Papyrus 32, P52, P50, P104, Titus, John, Matthew were all likely written at the beginning, beginning of the second century, possibly at the end of the first century. And when you're considering some, a scrap of the Gospel of John written that early, it's probably within 20 years of the autograph original of John coming off the, uh, not the printing press, but the handwritten manuscript. Second century Christians such as Papias and Polycarp knew John. You can argue, well, they're, they're just uh, telling tall tales, but uh, <laughs> I, I believe it's, it, it's, uh, it takes a lot of ingenuity to think that uh, these, the second generation of Christians is coming up with all kinds of lies when they themselves also paid a heavy price of their own lives for their testimony, just as the apostles did in most cases. Eyewitnesses and others who knew eyewitnesses did not suddenly disappear. <laughs> Uh, it takes uh, a whole lot of ingenuity to think that they did. They crawled around everywhere in the early church. And we'll have more to say about that in the coming weeks. And so you have uh, New Testament documents that were not produced in a vacuum. They were produced in a time frame in which eyewitnesses were still on hand. So when we read in a document such as 2 Peter chapter 1, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, the voice was born to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And this just after Peter says in verses 13 through 15, I've got to get these things down in writing so that after my departure, you may call these things to remembrance at every time. Last year, we uh, had a class on tactics and uh, we talked about three types of questions. Clarification question. You you have a, a skeptic at work or in, in the neighborhood or or uh, in your family that says, oh, you know, those gospels, they're, they're nothing but myths and legends. What do you mean by that? Myths and legends. Second question, the rationale. How, how do you come to that conclusion? Well, why do you say that? What, what are what's the evidence that convinces you that that they're nothing but myths and legends? And then you ask a third follow-up question when you, when, when their cards are, are on the table, you combine the way they give answer with some evidence of your own and asking a third follow-up question. 
And if you don't know anything else, and I'm going to give you a lot of data here in the next few weeks, but if you don't know anything else, you know enough to ask this question. And how does your view account for hard evidence X, Y, and Z? And that may be a specific question such as, then how do you account for eyewitnesses who preach the highest ethical system ever known, who are willing to die for the truth of their testimony? How does that jive with your view? And you may never win them, but maybe there's someone who's listening to the conversation who's more open-minded, and maybe you win that person who comes to you in private and later on and said, you know what, tell me, tell me more about this Jesus. And then you can take what uh, Sebastian and Derek have taught on Sunday morning and make them amazed by Jesus. That's all I have for tonight. Let's sing an invitation song.